see people coming in. Good day, everyone. Um, well, this session, uh, I was thinking on talking about other ways of um, championing and dealing and promoting open data that is not in the traditional industry way that we see in um, data science and government and all those things. Um, I am here to present one project that I'm part of that is called Living Data Project. So this presentation is entitled Championing Open Data in Ecology and Evolution Through Data Rescue. Um, I'll start by presenting myself. I am Gracieli Gino. I'm a postdoc of the Living Data Project at UBC, at the University of British Columbia. And I believe that rescuing data is a way to value the work of other sciences, both in the past and in the future. We'll know, uh, we'll discuss a little bit about it in a few minutes. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter and this handle works for GitHub as well. Uh, and the presentation is available at this link here. I can put in the chat, I think, let me see. Here's the link in the chat. Um, all right, so, but let's go back a little bit in the title of my presentation. So I'm t talking about championing open data in ecology and evolution. But what do I mean about, uh, what do I mean with open data in ecology and evolution? Uh, right now we have, uh, it's a cultural thing in research that it's a good practice that we uh, archive our data publicly, but in a recent research from Dominique Laroche uh, collabor and collaborators from this year, uh, they evaluated more than 4,000 papers and they found out that only 20% of them have data availability statement or associated open data. That's a really small amount, uh, given that this area is not that theoretical and argumentative. It's, it, a lot of research is done with data um, and from this 20%, only half of them have uh, data that is complete. This means that uh, they have data that we can use to reproduce the data, the, the analysis, um, and they have the raw data, they have uh, all parts of the data that are necessary for, to reproduce the analysis. And only 45% have data that is reusable. This means that they have uh, complete and comprehensive uh, metadata and um, also is complete, you know, uh, so these uh, characteristics are complementary. So um, thinking on that, we know that data archive, archiving is a good policy to uh, try to surpass this problem. Uh, and data archiving initiatives are great, but what about the data from the past? What do we do uh, about the data that until now were not archived, are not complete, or are not uh, comprehensively documented. Uh, data from the past are under threat. So they are constantly facing incremental loss, like uh, when we can't locate the authors or the data, when metadata is lost or unrecorded, or when data is stored in old hardware and old media that we can't read anymore that easily, like the old, <laughs> for not, for ours maybe it's not that old, but the floppy disks, there are a lot of data in floppy disks, but it's not that easy to read them nowadays. Um, and there's also the catastrophic loss, like when we um, lose museums from, for poor uh, infrastructure, when we have retirements and then researchers are not, um, reachable anymore. Uh, so these are common threats for old data. And then comes data rescue. And by data rescue, I mean transparent and reproducible preservation of valuable yet publicly inaccessible data and associated metadata to make it openly available for reuse. Uh, this is a concept we are exploring in a preprint called Data Rescue, Saving Valuable Ecological and Evolutionary Data from Extinction, that it's available in this link here too. Um, so this is a concept that we are using in our project to, um, to, to implement this framework of rescuing 
data that is threatened to make it openly available for reuse. And we are doing that because we think data rescue is important for a lot of things. Uh, for example, uh, it's because of rescuing data that we know about uh, the effects of climate change. Uh, this is an example of uh, old studies from children um, in Nova Scotia. Uh, and because of these data that are not like official and archived, um, we know about changes in, in flowering uh, due to climate change. So uh, rescuing data is important for us to build baselines to understand the changes in biodiversity uh, through changes in our planet. Another reason is that uh, this hidden data, this threatened data can uh, provide interesting and new uh, theoretical insights for ecology and evolution. So for example, this is the super classic pre-predator model that we use until today to understand population fluctuations and um, how biodiversity is changing and, and what's the equilibrium of some ecosystems. Um, and this model was built after uh, a pair of scientists have found diaries of the Hudson Bay Company in London. Um, so he is an extract of the letter that Elton written, has written uh, describing this experience. And, and he says that he has found an enormous amount of material to reconstruct the no show of rabbit and link cycles during the last hundred years. So it's a large amount of data that were not recorded, that was not in the spot for, the, for scientists back then, but he had rescued this data and because of that, they were, it was possible to understand population fluctuations. And all of these have costs. There's a large amount of money that we lose because we can replicate, uh, recollect the data. And we can't, when we are unable to recollect and um, we lose the continuity of data. Um, so we, when we need to go back to the field and recollect that data, discuss money, when we need to replace, when we need to, um, to rebuild our data set, all of this costs a lot of money and we are living in an era that we need to reduce these costs. So here enters the Living Data Project and I'm going to talk a little bit about how this works. Um, so the mission of the Living Data Project is to rescue legacy data sets and breathe new life into them through col collaborative analysis and synthesis. Uh, so the project is uh, inside the Canadian Institute of Ecology and Evolution and is hosted by four main universities in Canada. So the University of British Columbia, University of Regina, McGill and University de Montreal. Um, we are across the country and we focus on rescuing Canadian data sets, training uh, students from Canadian universities. And the project has uh, four aspects. So we have graduate courses. We have four graduate courses that are um, offered in the fall term. So we have courses about collaboration, data management, productivity and reproducibility and citizen statistics. We have data rescue internships where students have the chance to actually rescue uh, legacy data. And we have working groups where students have the chance to practice synthesis with this data. And we have training certificates. About the courses, um, inside them, we, we develop uh, important skills that are related to data science, data management. So for example, in collaboration, we uh, train students to uh, conflict resolution, digital collaboration, and acknowledgement of power imbalances. In the data management course, we train students uh, about collection, storage of data, uh, quality assessment, and documentation. In the productivity and reproducibility course, we discuss about open science best practice, transparency, pre-registrations and version control. And in the synthesis statistics, we 
discuss about data collation, integration, analysis, and visualization. visualization sorry. Um, so these are all important uh, skills to develop when we are training data scientists. And that it, those are skills that we use daily in ecology and evolution when we deal with a lot of data. Uh, so the data rescue internships, they work like that. So we have project partners. Uh, we focus on university researchers and librarians, governmental agencies and departments, and non-profit or private organizations. So these project partners send us, uh, apply for to host internships. They say like, uh, we have this data set and we need it tidy or we need documentation for this data set and we need archiving this data. Uh, can you help us? Um, and then we go through uh, evaluation of this, pro this uh, ap application. Uh, so we uh, evaluate, for example, the relevance of the data set, the extent, the geographical and temporal extent the novelty and rarity of this data set, the risk of loss, is this data set um, imminent to a big loss? And we try to evaluate the value, but this is a, this very subject. Uh, it's more like a, when nothing else happen, uh, helps, we try to evaluate the value. Uh, so we understand, we try to see, for example, the the monetary value of losing this data or uh, the potential for publications and discovery, uh, new scientific discoveries of this data set. And then we train students and select them to pair with this project. So we have graduate students at LTP partners universities. We open a call and they must have completed the courses of reproducibility and data management to be able to participate in this, in this internship. Uh, and they are matched to projects based on relevant skills. So uh, per year, we have 16 paid internships. Um, so these are students that are partnered with government agencies or faculties or NGOs to help them to organize and archive their data. So for example, we have this, uh, uh, this case of Vancouver Urban Bird Service. This was a project proposed by a graduate student in a university. Uh, this data set was kind of discontinuous from the 60s, 70s, and 90s. Um, it was, the geographical extent was local because it, it was covering Vancouver. Um, and it was digital, digitally inaccessible data. And this project, this data set is now archived, has now a DOI, so it can be citable, it's shared, it's open and it's free for everyone. And it also has a metadata that it's linked to, so this metadata links the data set to the original thesis. So all of this data is now available and it can be used by, ev by anyone and it can be understood and it can be uh, reused. So a second case is the historical pesticide applications in the Atlantic Canada. So this project was a project uh, proposed by a government agency, the Canadian Forestry Service. And the data source were standardized pesticide ap application program this data set was a more continuous series of applications from the 50s to the 90s. And the geographical extent was bigger now. Now it's a regional special coverage. And the, the data were paper records in a basement. So we literally had to dig the basement to find this data and to archive it. Um, uh, by the way, this project has uh, is so extent that it's now um, it's go it's ongoing. Um, and it's being renewed. So the working groups now, it's almost the same things, but uh, it's a different strategy. So we partner with university researchers and librarians, governmental agencies and departments, and also no profit private organizations. But now students are selected if they have completed the collaboration and the synthesis course, or if they are applying to 
to do it in the next term. Um, they are matched to projects based on relevant skills again, but now we have only four funded working groups offers per year. Uh, so, okay, back to the structure. We have these four things. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about the training certificates. So if a student uh, has done the productivity and reproducibility and data management course and have gone through a data rescue internship, they have the right to uh, ask for a certificate in data management and reproducible research. This is really important because they can add that to their CVs and um, show that to future employees. Uh, it's a, a formation that is not super traditional inside the biodiversity, ecology and evolution academic training. So that's an asset that we think uh, is really valuable for them. And another certificate is the, the certificate in synthetic and collaborative science. So this certificate is granted to students that went through working groups and did the collaboration and the synthesis statistics course. Uh, so a few numbers, until now we have about 40 students per graduate course. So we have four graduate course and we did it two times. So uh, a lot of students went through our graduate courses already. Uh, we had until now 24 interns, but we are starting eight internships next month. And we had two working groups with about 10 students each. And we are having another one until March, I think. And we have certified six trainees until now. And one of them got the two certificates, so we have seven certificates. Uh, so I believe that at the Living Data Project interns are the data scientists that you need. They are highly skilled in data management and synthesis. They are experienced in dealing with complicated data sets, and they are ready to integrate a diverse team of collaborators. Uh, so you can uh, be involved by applying to be a host in data rescue internships and letting people know that we have this uh, funded working group, this funded internship, so students can apply to. Uh, we have an open call for data rescue projects, and the deadline is November 1st for uh, internships that will start on or after May next year. And you can access our website with this link over here, bit.ly LDP partner. Um, and the process is really simple. You just need to fill out a form and we will get in touch with you. And thanks for listening. <laughs> so here is a, a, some contacts and the slide is shared in the, web, in the chat. I will share the link again. And if you have any questions, we have 10 minutes to discuss. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Uh, good question. Where, on which server located the data and paper after the publication? So it depends, but we prioritize archiving in Canadian servers. So even in, uh, we, we use a lot the OSF, the Open Science Framework, and we have Canadian, I think in, it's in Montreal, the server. Um, so when internship starts, for example, we invite uh, partners to upload the raw data set on OSF that is archived in a Canadian server. Um, and then interns work, work in these data sets and then the cleaned and um, the archive, the final archiving, it depends more on the organization that is proposing. So sometimes they have preferences for 
certain kinds of servers. So we try to respect that, but always prioritizing Canadian servers. Uh, how librarians and universities have been involved in your projects? How ro what roles have they played? Um, yeah, sure. So um, both uh, librarians and universities, researchers, um, everyone <laughs> can send us projects to to host internships. So sometimes they send they have this um, data set from a researcher that has retired in the department, and they send our aid to organize and to better archive these data sets. Um, they have played the roles at, uh, like, if they are from the partner organization, they act at, as mentors. They are working closely with the interns to um, solve questions about the meaning of data and, and this, sometimes uh, what does it mean each information inside the, the, the data set. So they work closely with interns more as a mentor. Um, and also with the working groups, they can propose working groups and act as working group leaders. Um, what else? Uh, we also sometimes invite them to, to give guest lectures in our courses. So if you're interested, just get in touch. Does that answer your question? Let me know. Thank you, Catherine. Do you have a project partnership that has stood out to you? Oh, <laughs> that's unfair. <laughs> um, mm, yeah, we have, because each project is so different. Um, I have uh, closely followed just three internships until now, because I've been working in this project since the beginning of this year. Um, but yeah, I really love how um, there are, I think there are two projects that I'm working on that are from Nature Conservancy Canada. And I love how they have all these data sets available and they are concerned about um, making it understandable, reachable and easy to read for everyone. So I think that's great. And I have, I think that's a lot of potential for government data especially from um, parks, uh, to transform the data sets in outreach tools. I think that's really important and that's amazing. Any other questions? I think I'll share the link for the presentation again. If you have any uh, ideas or questions, you, there's um, our email there, our website. Mm -hmm. 
there's my email as well if you want to contact me directly i'm open to talk more about rescuing data in canada Thank you, everyone. See you in the event. Have a good evening. Bye.